This video is devoted to uniform probability distributions. This was a concept introduced in the last video. Remember, a uniform sample space is one where all the elements have equal probabilities. This occurs so commonly in the real world that it's worth focusing on this and seeing what sort of special techniques are available whenever all the probabilities are the same. Let's start by thinking about a club electing a president and vice president. The club has 14 members, which includes six men and eight women. Assuming that all members are equally likely to be elected, what's the probability that both officers will be women? Here's a way to think about that. Let's just focus on which two people are elected without thinking about who is the president and who's the vice president. The question only asks, uh, what's the chances the two officers will be women? So we really don't have to think about who is president and who's vice president in order to answer the question. We have 14 people, and two of them are going to be elected. And from our basic counting techniques, we know using the combinations formula, that the number of different ways of choosing two people from 14 can be easily obtained by the combination formula. Turns out to be 91. So there are 91 different ways that two people could be selected from the 14 uh, as the officers. And this is, again, not distinguishing between who's president and who's vice president, just talking about selecting two from the 14. If you were going to pick two officers from the eight women, you would, of course, be selecting the two people from the set of eight women. And the combinations formula gives us 28 ways of doing that. So what we know now is that there are 91 possible outcomes, and 28 of those 91 outcomes would be cases where both officers are women. The answer to this question is 28 over 91. And the reason is because we're dealing with 91 equally likely outcomes. So the probability of each one of these 91 cases would be 1 over 91, 28 of those cases. So their probabilities would add up to 28 over 91. Now let's do an alternate solution in which we do keep track of who's elected to which office. So we're going to be thinking permutations instead of combinations in this solution. We have the 14 members. We're going to select one person as president and one person as vice president. Let's first think about who's selected as president. 14 choices for president, and then after, those, after one of those is selected, that leaves 13 choices for vice president. 14 choices for president times 13 choices for vice president is permutations of 14 club members, choosing two of them, an ordered list because one is going to be, the first one is going to be president, the second one vice president. So keeping track of who fills which office, we get 182 as the number of possibilities for electing first a president and secondly a vice president. If we do it in such a way that both are women, then we have eight choices for which woman serves as president times seven choices for which serves as vice president, giving us 56 ways of filling the two offices consecutively with two women. 182 equally likely outcomes 56 of those outcomes be in cases where both officers are women. 56 over 182 is the same as 28 over 91, which is the same answer we obtained before. Now this should be reassuring to you because we arrive at the correct answer no matter whether we keep track of who fills which office or whether we ignore who fills which office. In other words, we can, we can treat this particular problem uh, either by just considering which two people are elected or else by specifically concerning ourselves with who is president and who's vice president. The problem doesn't 
require us to keep track of that more detailed information, but we arrive at the correct answer either way. In both approaches, in effect, what we did was to count the total number of possible outcomes and put that in the denominator and count the number of outcomes that make up the event that we're studying and put that in the numerator. The probability of that event occurring is just the number of ways that that thing can happen divided by the total number of possible outcomes. And the idea is as simple as in this example. If you're dealing from a 52 card deck, then the chances of it being a heart is 13 over 52, one fourth, because there are 13 cards in the 52 card deck. The probability is one fourth because one fourth of the cards are hearts. Charlie has a bunch of socks that are mixed up in his drawer where he keeps his socks. He has four pairs of white socks, two pairs of black socks, and three pairs of blue socks. With these socks all scrambled up, he gets up in the morning in the dark, reaches in the drawer, and pulls out two socks. What's the probability the socks will be of the same color? Well, how many socks does he have? Four plus two plus three is nine pairs of socks, so that means 18 socks. And he's picking two socks because he has two feet. So he's picking two socks from the 18 socks in the drawer, and the number of ways of picking two socks from 18 is given by the combinations formula. 18 times 17 divided by two is 153. So that's the total number of possible outcomes when he reaches in his drawer and pulls out two socks. Now, we're interested in the probability the socks will be the same color. There are three ways that can happen. It can happen if he gets two white socks, it can happen if he gets two black socks, or it will happen if he gets two blue socks. To get two white socks, the two socks he's picking have to come from the eight white socks that are in the drawer, and that can happen in 28 ways according to the combinations formula. There are only four black socks in the drawer, so to get two black socks, the two socks he's picking have to come from those four. Combinations formula gives us six ways that can happen, and with six blue socks, we get 15 ways that he can get a pair of blue socks. If we total all these up, 28 plus 6 plus 15, we have a total of 49 different outcomes in which his socks match. That's 49 out of the 153 total number of possible outcomes. So that gives us a probability of 49 over 153 for our answer. So that's just a little bit less than a third. A little less than a third is the chances that Charlie gets a matching pair of socks. Eric and Edith have applied for jobs at Sadlax. There are six job openings available. Twenty-five people have applied. First question is, what's the probability that Edith gets a job? And then secondly, what's the chances they both get jobs? And our instructions here are to assume that the six people who get jobs are to be randomly chosen from among the 25 applicants. For part A, what's the probability that Edith gets a job? We're giving six jobs out among 25 people. So we start by counting all the possible ways that you can choose which six of the 25 people get jobs. That's a, comb that's a job for the combinations formula. Plug, plug that in, combinations of uh, choosing six things from 25. Combinations formula cranks out this many ways to pick the six. Now, of that total number 
very large number of possible outcomes, how many of those cases would be a case, a case where Edith gets a job? If Edith gets one of the jobs, then that means there will be five other people who get jobs, right? There are six jobs altogether. So if Edith gets one of the jobs, that means five other people will get jobs from among the other 24 people. One of the 25 is Edith. So there will be five other jobs to be given out among the other 24 people besides Edith. So the number of ways that, that, that Edith can get a job is just a question of how many ways can you pick which other five people from the other 24 people get jobs, plug that into the combinations formula, determine how many people, how many ways there are of, of choosing that, you come out with 42,000 and some. So it would be the quotient of those two numbers that reduces to 6 over 25. Uh, and it's probably worth, it's worth doing the arithmetic to see why it reduces to that uh, rather than working with these very large numbers right here. Um, in, in any case, it reduces to 6 over 25, which is 0.24. But notice again, see that you see the common thread here. What we're always doing is counting the total number of possible outcomes as our denominator and counting how many of those outcomes fit into the event which we're talking about, whose probability we're computing. But in any case, that takes care of part A. Let's move on to part B. In part B, we're looking at the cases where both Eric and Edith get jobs. Notice the denominator doesn't change. We're still giving out six jobs among 25 people. But now if Eric and Edith get jobs, how many other people get jobs? That leaves only four jobs for the other people among how many other people are there besides Eric and Edith? Well, there are 23. So we're giving out four jobs among the remaining 23 people, and that can be done in 8,855 ways out of this many total ways. And here, the fractional arithmetic reduces to 0.05. So that's only one chance in 20 that both Eric and Edith get jobs. But once again, we're again listing the total number of outcomes in the denominator and in the numerator counting the number of possibilities which fit into the event that we're talking about, which in this case is the event that both Eric and Edith get jobs. Let's turn to poker. Pud's playing five card draw. When he picks up the hand that's dealt to him, what's the probability that it will be a full house? A full house is a very, very good poker hand. We have two things to count here. We have to count the total number of possible poker hands, and that's straightforward with the combinations formula because we know there are 52 cards in the deck, and we're, dealing, we're playing five card draw, so we're dealt five cards from the 52. Combinations formula cranks that out as something over two and a half million possible poker hands. Now, I believe in one of the earlier videos in part four, we also counted the number of ways to get a full house. Just to review how that was done, a full house, you remember, was three cards of one type and two cards of another type, like, for example, three jacks and two sevens. And this is what we found when we did this calculation earlier, and the reason was because you can think of it as 13 choices for which rank card the, the set of three alike comes from, like the three jacks times 12 possibilities for which other rank, like sevens, for example, would be where the two cards come from. And then you also have to take into account that it can be any three of the four cards of the one rank, like any three of the four jacks, and any two of the four cards of the other rank, like any two of the four sevens, for instance. When you put that together with the multiplication principle, you come out with something over 3,000 ways that you can get a full house, but that's a very small portion of the total number of poker hands. And when you divide that out, you find out that there's little only a one tenth, a little only a slightly more than a one tenth of one percent chance of being dealt a, a full house 
on your in, in your initial five cards. Now, of course, in most poker hands, uh, five card draw, for example, you get to, to give away some cards and then get some more. So your chances of ending up with a full house are substantially better than that. But what we've calculated here is the probability of being dealt that in your initial five cards. But again, we're illustrating again that because of all poker hands being equally probable, it's just a counting problem. We count the total number of possible poker hands and put that on the bottom, and then we have to count the number of hands that constitute a full house, and we put that in the numerator. That's the common thread when you're working with situations where all outcomes are equally likely. Mary has written some postcards. Four are going to California. Six are going to South Carolina. But then after she did that, four of the cards have been lost. And she's worrying about the probability, specifically, what's the probability that all the cards lost were addressed to South Carolina? Or secondly, what's the probability that three of the lost cards were addressed to California? What is it we need to count here? We need to count the total number of possibilities for which cards were lost. We know that four cards have been lost out of the ten postcards that she wrote. She wrote four to California, six to South Carolina. She wrote ten cards, four of them have been lost. Possibility of 210, uh, number of possibilities is 210 as far as which cards were lost. So this is our total number of possible outcomes for lost cards, which is what will go in our denominator. Now in our first question, what's the probability that all the cards lost are going to South Carolina? Remember we have six cards going to South Carolina. In order for all four lost cards to come from that group, the four lost cards have to come from those six, and the combinations formula gives us 15 ways that that can happen. So that's 15 out of the 210 possible outcomes would be cases where all the lost cards are going to South Carolina. So that gives us the probability that we're looking for for the first question. For the second question, where we're looking at the probability that exactly three of the lost cards were addressed to California, no change in the denominator since we're still talking about four lost cards from among the ten that were written. Now we're looking at the case where three of the lost cards came from the four addressed to South Carolina, to, to California rather, and one of them comes from the six that were addressed to South Carolina. The combinations formula gives us the number of ways each of those things can happen. We multiply because of the multiplication principle and we need to have both of those things happen in order to be in the event that we're discussing. So we come out with 24 ways that it can happen that three of the lost cards would be to California and one of them to South Carolina. That's 24 out of the 210 possible outcomes. A school teacher is doing safety patrol duty, or rather assigning children to do safety patrol duty. The children are Eddie, Bob, Mike, and Alice, and they work on four different streets, Elm Park, Van Dyke, and Oakwood. What's the probability Mike will be assigned duty at Elm Street? What we're doing here is matching up the four students with the four streets, and that's an ordering problem. It's a matter of how many different ways can we order the four students. So as they match the four streets, so the number of possibilities is going to be four factorial. Think of it as just uh, having a list of the names of the streets and then putting the name of one of the children in each uh, spot. Four factorial possibilities. Now the event we're talking about is Mike being assigned to Elm Street. If we match Mike up with Elm, that leaves three factorial ways of matching up the other three children with the other three streets. Just think about it as having three blanks and we have to fill in the other three names and the other three blanks. So that's four factorial ways uh, altogether, but matching Mike with Elm, that leaves us only three factorial ways 
of matching the others. So we have four factorial possible outcomes, but only three factorial outcomes in the event whose probability we're computing. So this reduces to one-fourth as our probability. What's the probability Mike gets Elm Street and Alice gets Oakwood? Total number of possibilities is unchanged. We're still matching up four children with four streets, four factorial ways of doing it. But if we match Mike up with Elm and Alice up with, Oak, with Oakwood, then that leaves only two other children and two other streets, and there are only two factorial ways of doing that remaining matching. So that leaves us only that many ways of doing things so that these two conditions are met. That's two of the 24 possible ways. Probability now is 1 12th. Finally, what's the probability Mike gets Elm, Alice gets Oakwood, and Bob gets Van Dyke? Well, if you're going to match things this way, then that leaves only Eddie, and Eddie would have to get the only remaining street, which is Park Street. So there's only one way to do it if you're going to meet all these conditions, and that's one of the four factorial, one of the 24 possible uh, outcomes, so probability 1 24th. Six married couples are attending a party. Two door prizes are going to be given away to two different people we have two questions. One asks, what's the probability that a married couple wins both prizes? So, for example, Mr. Smith might win one prize and Mrs. Smith win the other one. Or second, what's the probability that one prize goes to a man and the other to a woman? For the, for the first question, We know that we're giving away two prizes among 12 people, so two of the 12 people will win prizes. Let's count the possibilities, how many possibilities there are with regard to which two people win the prizes. That's simply a matter of specifying two of the 12 as the prize winners. The combinations formula gives us that number, 12 times 11 divided by 2 is 66. That's the total number of possibilities for which two of the people who are at the uh, party win the prizes. So that's going to be our denominator. What we have to count for our numerator is how many ways it can happen that a married couple wins both prizes. Now stop and think. How many married couples do we have? This is simpler. Don't, don't make this harder than it is. We have six married couples. So that means there are six diff if, if a couple is going to win the prizes, that means there are six possibilities for which couple uh, wins the two prizes. It could be the Smiths, it could be the Joneses, and so forth. Six married couples, six possibilities for which couple wins the prizes if the prizes are to be won by a married couple. So that six out of the 66 total which gives us a probability of 1 11th. Um, let's pursue this a little bit further just to get it to be intuitively appealing to you. Think about the prizes as give, being given out one at a time. We've got these 12 people and let's say they draw the prizes by drawing out of a hat or something and find and they've given out the first prize so we know who won the first prize. Now remember the prizes have to be won by two different people. So how many people are eligible for the second prize? There are 11, there are six married couples there so that's 12 people. So that leaves 11 people eligible for the second prize and of those 11 people how many of them are married to the person who won the first prize? One of them, right? So of the 11 remaining people who are eligible for the second prize, only one of them is the spouse of whoever won the first prize. So that, again, would say one chance in 11 that the prize winner for prize number two is the spouse of the person who won prize number one. So that's, I'm simply suggesting another way to think about it that should be intuitively satisfying to you and which confirms the answer that we just calculated. 
Now let's move on to part B. What's the probability that one prize goes to a man and the other to a woman? Of the 66 possible outcomes, we have to count how many of those cases would be the case where one prize winner is a man and the other is a woman. So for the two prize winners to split that way, the prize winners have to include one of the six men and one of the six women. The number of ways to specify one of the six men as a prize winner is six. The number of ways to choose one of the six women as a prize winner is six. Multiply because of the multiplication principle, and you get 36 ways to pick a man and a woman as the prize winners. That's 36 out of the 66 total for a probability of 6 over 11. Would you like to hear an intuitively satisfying way of seeing why 6 over 11 is the right answer? Let's go back and think again about the prizes being awarded one at a time. If you've given out the first prize, there are 11 people eligible for the second prize. How many of them are the same sex as the person who won the first prize? Five, right? So that means of the people eligible for the second prize, five of them are same sex as the person who won the first prize. Six of them are opposite sex of the person who won the first prize. So that's six chances in 11 that prize winner number two will be the opposite sex of prize winner number one, which confirms the calculation we did by a quite different way using the combinations formula already. Lots of times people divide up so as to be able to play some kind of game. You want two teams of equal size. So let's suppose we have ten people dividing up to play basketball in this, in this instance, two of the ten are brothers, and our first question we're going to consider is what are the chances the brothers will be on the same team if the players divide up arbitrarily? And then we'll come back later and presuming that one of the people in the group is a friend of theirs named Max, what's the probability that all three of them will be on the same team? But let's start just with the two brothers. What's the chances the two brothers wind up on the same team? Let's think of the teams as Team A and Team B, and let's focus on Team A and think about how many possibilities there are for what players are on Team A. There are ten people. Team A will be made up with f of five of the ten people. So the combinations formula will give us how many different possibilities there are for which five of the ten wind up on Team A. Now, in the numerator, let's count how many possibilities there are to fill out team A in such a way that the two brothers are on that team. If the two brothers are going to be on that team, then they will occupy two of the five spots on that team, and three of the other eight people, not counting the two brothers, three of the other eight people will be the other players on that team. So combinations of eight choosing three would be the number of ways to fill out the team, starting with the two brothers and picking three of the other eight. So this fraction right here, total number of possibilities in the denominator and number of ways to fill out team A built around the two brothers to start with, this would give us the number of ways to make up team A that includes the two brothers. But we have to keep in mind the question simply says, what's the probability the brothers will be on the same team? So we have to realize that it would also work out with the brothers on the same team if the two brothers were on team B rather than team A. That would give us another term that's the same, so we can just take the term that we already have and multiply times two. Or alternately, if you wanted to, you could think about the possibilities being the two brothers on team A or making up team A so that neither of the brothers was on it, in which case that's the same as saying both of the brothers are on team B. But in any case, it's important to realize when we've done this first calculation, that's only half the cases. So we need to multiply by two to have all the cases where the two brothers are on the same team. And when you do this total amount of arithmetic here, you get four ninths. The alternative calculation that's shown here in brackets uh, 
denominator is number of ways of filling out team A without any restrictions on how you do it. In the numerator, I'm thinking filling out team A to include the two brothers by including both of the two brothers and three people from the remaining eight people. And then the reason for doubling is the same reason that there was for doubling over here. Now let's throw in the friend Max into the mix. What's the probability the brothers and their friend Max will all be on the same team? So what's going to be different about this calculation from the calculation in part A? We still have this many ways of filling out team A. If we're going to include the brothers and Max on team A, then that will make up three of the players and we'll just be choosing two of the other seven players as the remaining two players on team A. So this fraction would represent the probability if team A is made out randomly, the probability that both brothers and Max all wind up on team A. And then we'd also have to throw in the probability for them all winding up on team B, which is why we have to double our answer for it to be correct. And then the alternative way of thinking about it shown on the right here is analogous to the alternative way of thinking about the first calculation. We're now going to scramble the letters in the word mammal, write them out in a row, What's the probability that the three M's come first? What's the probability that none of the M's appear side by side? Two questions. Think about taking the six letters, of which there are three M's, two A's, and an L, and dropping those six letters down into these six spots. We learned in part four how to count the number of possible ways of doing that. You could first think about which three slots get occupied by the three M's. So pick three of the six spots for the letter M. Then pick two of the remaining three spots for the letter A, the copies of A, the two copies of A. And then put in the remaining spot, put the one L. So doing this arithmetic with the multiplication principle used in combination with the combinations formula, uh, we count 60 ways to arrange those letters from the word mammal in a row. So that will give us the denominator for our calculation. Now, the question is, what's the probability the three M's come first? If the three M's are to come first, then they have to occupy these three spots, which means we'll have M, M, M in those spots. And then the two A's and the L have to occupy the other two spots. Pick which two of those three spots are occupied by the A's, and then the L will remain the other, will occupy the other spot. That can be done in three ways. So that really comes to only three of the total of 60 possible outcomes which give us uh, the three M's in the first three spots. So that's a probability of 1 over 20. So now let's move down to part B and see what the solution for part B looks like. We're considering the event that none of the M's appear side by side. Counting the total number of possibilities is the same as before. We've already counted that there are 60 possible ways to arrange the letters. So now we need to count how many of those possibilities are there for which none of the M's would appear side by side. So for example, here's one arrangement that would give us an arrangement with none of the M's side by side. Let's try to list all the ways we can have them as far as the positioning of the M's. 
the M's could occupy those three blanks or these three or these three or these three. And I believe you'll conclude that that's all the possibilities for where the M's can go. If none of the M's are going to appear side by side, then the M's have to go in one of these sets of blanks. Now, once we have placed the M's, we have to put the two A's in two of the remaining three spots and the L in the last spot. So combinations of three, of three things choosing two. This counts the number of ways of putting in the two A's once we know where the M's go. And this is, of course, just one. The L has to go in the remaining spot. The four here is simply the four different ways of placing the M's that are shown. So the rationale here is four possibilities for which arrangements we have for the M's times three ways of positioning the A's once the M's have been placed and then only one remaining way of putting in the L. So that gives us 12 possible ways of distributing the letter so that none of the M's are side by side and that's 12 out of the 60 total for a probability of one-fifth. A shelf has 15 books. Four of them are travel guides, five are biographies, and six of them are fiction. If you randomly pick three books off the shelf, what's the probability they'll all be fiction? We're picking three of the 15 books, so the denominator will simply be the number of possibilities for that being done, picking three books from the 15. The event whose probability we're computing is the event that all the, big, all the books chosen are fiction. Six of the books are fiction, so we're looking at the event where the three books chosen come from the six fiction books. So once again, total number of possibilities for picking three books from the 15 divided into total number of cases where the three books would be from the six fiction books, which is the event whose probability we're trying to compute. What's the probability two of them will be travel guides and one will be a biography? No change in the total number of possibilities. We're still picking three books from the 15. Now for the numerator, we need to count how many possibilities there are if we're picking two of the travel guides and one of the biographies. Multiplication principle comes in because we're doing both of those things. What's the probability you select one book from each of the three genres? We have three types, travel, biography, fiction. What's the probability that you, when you pick three books randomly off the shelf, what's the probability you get one of each type? No change in the total number of possibilities. Now we're picking, counting the number of ways we can pick one travel guide, one biography, and one fiction. Again, tying it all together with the multiplication principle because the event we're looking at requires for each of those to happen. What's the probability all three will be the same genre? That is, three travel guides, three biographies, or three fictions. Think of it as three separate problems. The chances of getting three travel guides would involve counting the number of ways we could pick three from the four travel guides. Here's the probability of getting three travel guides. Similarly, here's the probability of getting three biographies. And finally, this is the probability of getting three of the fiction books because we would be picking three from the six fiction books. So just do those computations separately, 
and then combine them, add them together. Four ways for getting three travel guides plus 10 ways for getting uh, three biographies plus 20 ways for getting three fictions gives us a total of 34 possible ways of getting three books from the same genre and so our probability is 34 over 455. And finally, what's the probability that two of the books will be from one of the categories and the remaining book will be from a different category? Let's think of all the ways that can happen. We could get two travel books and a biography, two biographies and a travel, two travels and a fiction, two fictions and one travel, two biographies and one fiction, or two fictions and one biography. That's it. If we're going to get two from one category and one from the other category, then one of these things has to happen. Now, in fact, this one we calculated as one of the earlier steps in this example. Uh, so one way of doing the problem would be simply to calculate the probability of these other five cases in a similar manner and then add up the six probabilities to get the answer. A little bit long-winded, but nothing particularly difficult about doing that. There is another, and in fact substantially quicker, approach, however, that I would like to remind you of, and that is to simply keep in mind that this is bound to happen unless you have all three books from the same category or else you have books from the three different categories. In other words, no matter what three books you get, they're either going to be all three from the same category or two from one category and one from another category or else one book from each of the three categories. This is one of those three cases and we have already computed the probabilities of the other two cases. So we can get the probability of this case by simply doing one minus the probabilities of the other two cases. One minus the probability of all three being from the same category, which we've already calculated, and also subtract off the probability of them being from three different calculators, uh, three different categories. So this is in effect making use of the fact that the probability of the complement of an event is one minus the probability of an event. The complement of the event we're looking at here is the union of these two other events that we've already talked about and whose probability we've already calculated and these two previous events are mutually exclusive so the probability of their union is just the sum of their probabilities, so um, subtracting off the probability of the union of the two previous events is just a matter of subtracting off each of them one at a time. 